thank you chris good evening everyone we have with us the management team of ifl finance represented by mr nirmal jain who is the chairman uh, mr rajesh rajak who is the cfo uh, mr monu ratra who is the ceo of ifl home finance and mr venkatesh n who is the ceo of ifl samasta microfinance with this uh, now i shall hand over to mr nirmal jain for opening remarks over to you sir uh thank you <laughs> and welcome everybody in our next call so maybe i'll just start with the macro environment as we see it uh, and how we have been uh, progressing on our strategy and then i'll hand it over to our cfo for ajit for a more detailed commentary on the results and then we can have q&a so i mean all of us are well aware uh, of the, there is a in terms of surprise element there is a suddenly wave three very swift but less uh, damaging and hopefully uh, is tapering off and will be behind us very soon uh, we i mean without commenting on stock market i mean they they can gyrate in their own manner but a macro environment is looking much better as we are seeing that earnings of the most of the companies have shown significant improvement our uh, government spending has gone up and the budget also people are expecting the momentum to continue uh, we see that government is spending a lot on health infrastructure as well and uh, last year because of the sudden covid wave 2 and 3 the revenue expenditure was up uh, by at least 0.8% of gdp uh, as compared to the budget estimate and hopefully if government doesn't have to spend that money again this year there was a see there will be a lot of leeway in the budget to uh, spend more and make sure that the economic growth momentum continues besides uh, a lot of groundwork has been done on this investment and um, maybe lic will go through but significant part of this investment target will not be achieved in this year but that may be a good news for next year because government will have a lot more money in a year than actually they need to uh, get the economic momentum right in terms of financial sector i think bank credit growth by by 9% is healthy uh, which was you know is moving up from you know what we used to see around 5 to 6% uh, the liquidity has eased significantly uh, and what we are seeing is that uh, the demand for credit uh, seems very optimistic and sanguine and it looks like that uh, as the economic activity is picking up things are improving and credit demand will also look up uh, uh, coming to our uh, asset finance uh, uh, momentum is good our core products are showing strong growth and uh, as we step into this quarter which is signally uh, peak quarter for financial services uh, Uh, the credit growth momentum is there uh in terms of collection efficiency and asset quality also we are seeing an improvement in last few quarters every quarter there's some surprise or another and obviously uh, that impacts the reported result so this time we had uh, there are two factors that have impacted our provision uh, in a significant manner and also the gnp uh, as we reported uh, one has been rbi circular impact which was uh, a bit of a surprise for the industry uh, it doesn't really impact the quality of assets that we have on our balance sheet but it does impact uh, the reported numbers and hopefully as the industry gets adjusted in terms of how uh, to deal with this in next few quarters the numbers will come back to the normal trend line but for the time being uh, that has impacted our gnp as well and besides microfinance uh, you know faced little difficult times uh, with continued impact of covid wave 3 uh, hopefully even those things will get better liquidity in the system has improved significantly and uh, if we see our own balance sheet then at 9000 crores this all time high liquidity that we are carrying which has a small impact on our uh, margins also because of the negative carry that we have but i think uh, what we have done is a prudent policy keeping in mind the growth uh, trajectory that is ahead of us and also uh you know the sudden volatility that can be caused by uh, covid or global factors as well uh in terms of interest rate and liquidity although they look benign at this point in time but obviously uh, everybody is talking about and is worried about what us fed will do uh, given the inflation situation there people uh, most of the investors are getting prepared for rate hike there but only uh, question is uh, how much and when and whenever it happens it can have some impact on emerging markets that it always had historically 
In India also, uh, most experts uh, expect upward bias on the interest rate. Uh, our belief is that even if there's a rate hike, it will be marginal as compared to the base interest rate in India, which is already high. So India was never at a zero or near zero percent interest rate. Uh, but from these levels, 25 basis point or 50 basis points can be taken in stride. As far as we are concerned, we have most of our assets are short tenor. We have also, uh, in fact, increased our liquidity buffer. And uh, now, in the last two, three years after Ireland of crisis, uh, we have tried to make sure that our liabilities are for longer period, even if there's a higher cost. So with this, uh, uh, we seem to be reasonably comfortable in terms of liquidity as well as uh, tapping the growth opportunity. We have been investing a lot in digital transformation and a couple of initiatives that we have highlighted in analyst presentation this time. One is our DIY loan, which is completely paperless, presentless, and you can do it in two ways. One is you can download an app called My Money, and entire journey is automated, right from starting your application to transfer of documents to transfer of loan amount back to your bank account. And the same journey can be done on WhatsApp also, which is industry first. While many players do generate reach on WhatsApp, but what we have done on WhatsApp is end-to-end -end completion of entire journey, is seeing good traction in terms of disbursement last quarter, although the volumes are still small, but on the base of quarter before, they have quadrupled, and we see strong growth continuing there. Another initiative uh, uh, on which we have worked our technology uh, backbone to be very strong, and that is Gold Loan at Home. We started in a few cities, we'll roll it out. Uh, this product basically uh, targets customers and where the gold can be collected at home and uh, custom, the money gets digitally transferred to customer's account. Customer has flexibility to repay at any point in time, reduce the interest burden, uh, can top up or renew the loan. And also we can deliver the gold back at customer's place uh, should, uh, whenever the loan is fully repaid. Uh, in this initiative also, I think we'll have an advantage uh, our brand is known, the customers have seen our branches and brand, and therefore the trust element is higher. Uh, so with this, I hand it over to uh, Rajesh, who will take you through uh, the details, and then we'll have the floor open for q &A. Thank you, Mr. Jain. Uh, let me take you all through a, a brief commentary of our recent results. Uh, IFL finance uh, profit after tax was highest ever at Rs. 310 crores in Q3 FI22, up 15% year-on-year and 6% quarter-on-quarter, driven by strong volume growth. We recorded pre-provision operating profit of Rs. 650 crores during the quarter, which was up 6% year-on-year and 12% quarter-on-quarter. Loan AUM grew by 11% year-on-year and 6% quarter-on-quarter to 46,780 crores. Loan AUM for core products, in fact, will faster year-on-year at 16% year-on-year and 6% quarter-on-quarter to 43,293 crores, driven mainly by small ticket, home loan, gold loan, and microfinance loans. 94% of our loans are retail in nature and 67% of our retail loans are PSL compliant, excluding gold loans, which are not classified as PSL loans. The largest share of retail and PSL compliant loans are of significant value in the current environment where we can sell down these loans to raise long-term resources. In line with the capital optimizing strategy, 35% of our AUM is assigned or securitized as of December 2021. During the quarter, IFL Finance tied up with DBS Bank and Union Bank for, uh, of India for co-lending of gold loan and home loan respectively. This is over and above our existing tie-ups. We added over 550 branches and more than 6,000 employees during the current financial year. Cost to income ratio increased to 39% as compared to FY21. Uh, due to expansion in our physical and digital footprint. Uh, annualized ROE for quarter three stood at 20.7%, driven by annualized ROA of 2.9%, despite large investment in growth causing spike in operating costs. Capital adequacy ratio was 25.4% on an overall basis, and tier one capital adequacy stood at 18%. These are much higher than the statutory requirement of 10% for tier one and total capital requirement of 15%. A total capital of home finance and microfinance subsidiaries also remained healthy at 31.7 and 20.4% respectively. Our average cost of borrowings declined by 27 basis points year-on-year year to 8.7%. Our gross 
NPS stood at 2.8 percent and net NPS at 1.5 percent as of 31st December 2021. This includes the impact of the RBI notification dated 12th November 2021. With implementation of ECL model under India, the provision coverage stands at 133 percent. Collection efficiency has improved across segments. Microfinance collection shows a marginal dip since quarter two because of high arrear collection in early, of earlier quarters in quarter two. During the quarter, we raised 4,300 crores through term loans, bonds, and refinance. Out of which, we raised 1,100 crores via refinancing, which included 850 crores from National Housing Bank. In addition, loans of 3,600 crores were assigned during the year. Cash and cash equivalents and committed credit lines from banks and institutions of Rs 9,145 crores were available as on 31st December 2021. Adequate to meet not only near-term liabilities, but also to fund the growth momentum. We have a positive ELM, whereby inflows cover or expect, expect or, or exceed expected outflows across all buckets. Additionally, IFL Home Finance raised 404 crores through public issue of secured bonds in January 2022. A brief for digital updates, uh, we continue to focus on digitization and analytics to improve customer experience and enable a convenient one-stop shop for customers' credit and investment needs. During the previous quarters, we had mentioned about our digital DIY, do-it-yourself initiatives for disbursement through WhatsApp and My Money app. Disbursements under MSME DIY loans grew more than fourfold to 114 crores during the quarter. More than 18,000 customers have, onboard, have been onboarded till date under DIY initiatives. Our gold loan delivered at home initiative is also getting significant traction. Disbursement under this initiative grew 31% quarter on quarter to 137 crores during the quarter. Jatpat Home Loans, a pan India product for instant home loan onboarding, continues to do well as 100% of the loans disbursed during quarter 3 were sourced through Jatpat Loans. The corresponding percentage for previous year, uh, same quarter, was 88%. IIFL Loans app is being increasingly used for various transactions by customers and has been especially beneficial during COVID lockdown times giving customers ease and convenience of access. We, are, we, uh, we have around 2 lakh average active users on the app for the month of December. That brings an end to the update. We are now happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the queue, you may press star and then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Our first question is from Sushant Farik from HSBC Securities. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, thanks for taking my uh, question. Uh, I just had the one uh, couple of questions uh, on the uh, uh, NPA part. Uh, if you could just uh, uh, tell us what exactly has been the impact of the RBI uh, circular on overall NPAs uh, and uh, if we have taken any additional uh, provisions against the same. And uh, also, secondly, I just wanted to understand what the restructured outstanding is uh, as of uh, this episode. So, the impact on GNP is around 30 basis points of the RBI circular. The restructured book movement we are given in a slide number 18, which was now is 937 as of December end against 1027 uh, last quarter. The DCCO amount has fallen significantly from 1800 to 600 as most of the projects have come out of DCCO. Uh, got it. Uh, got it. Thanks for this. Uh, just one more question. Uh, are there any plans on uh, normalizing the liquidity buffer eventually uh, or do we have any glide path towards that? So liquidity buffer, I think, okay. Normally, we want to have liquidity for a year, uh, uh, you know, in terms of all the contractual liability. So, the current liquidity that we see, plus minus 10 percent, uh, and obviously uh, over a period of time, as our volumes grow, our book grows, uh, this will also grow. 
it will be higher at December end, but uh, you can say that around 7, 8,000 will be a you know, reasonable number in these, uh, uh, for this book size. Uh, understood. Uh, thanks, that was from my case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from um, Akshay Ashok from Dalal Broker Stockbroking. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Congratulations on a good set of numbers. Sir, I have uh, three questions. So first, why the disbursement in home loans this time did not see a pickup on a QOQ basis? Any particular reason? Uh, and the second question will be, uh, this call ending, if you could just uh, elaborate on uh, the, whether the disbursements have started with the banks that you have tied up with and what is the progress on that? Uh, yeah, first if you could just answer these two questions. So, Monu, you want to uh, take this thing? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Mr. Akshay. Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So if you look at the disbursement in home loans, so they, they look flattish uh, because there was a bit of a pent up in Q2, which we had uh, from Q1. But otherwise we ended uh, December pretty aggressively, rather December numbers of disbursements were our all time high of last one and a half years. So we expect that the Q4 should be a, a much, uh, uh, much significant uh, number to look at. Uh, but yes, because of the pent up thing, which we had in Q1, which came into Q2, we did it very well. <laughs> Uh, we yeah. went over in Q2 and got booked in Q2, the disbursement, yeah. the early part of Q2, because Q1, I think, was impacted by COVID. Uh, and, uh, then, yeah. yeah, so then coming to the, uh, as far as December itself is concerned, as I told you, we did an all-time high numbers in home loans for the last one and a half years. Then coming on the co-lending part, as far as home loan uh, part is concerned, we were able to uh, do a co-lending of uh, nearly 850 crores uh, with uh, multiple banks. And uh, so that's been a great uh, experience and experiment, which I, we think is going to only solidify from here. Uh, so we did 850 crores of disbursements uh, in uh, under uh, co-lending uh, for home loans. And similarly, uh, some numbers have also been done from other products uh, like gold loan as well. Okay, so you got into agreements with, with two banks, uh, Development Bank of Singapore, uh, is it? And no. Yeah, uh, the product price. So there are no, product-wise things. Yes, sir, yeah. sir told that uh, you got into agreements with two yeah, banks. Yeah, so we have started with DBS, uh, uh, and last quarter we've done a uh, lot of technology integration and testing, and we are starting with them. So gold loan uh, is something that we are doing with DBS at this point in time. So we have multiple banks for multiple products. Uh, uh, yeah, so D uh, Development Bank of Singapore, we have started the gold loan product. Yeah. And then uh, last quarter portfolio, the idea was to run it down, right? Uh, why this quarter on a QOQ basis, there was a 2.2% growth uh, in your AUM in construction and real estate. Did you give incremental loans? Or something? Yes, you so don't, I, guys don't give a disbursement figure, right, for construction and real estate. Uh, yeah, sure. So you guys saw 2.2% AUM growth in this quarter in for construction That's and real estate. And yeah. historically, the book has been running down for the past several quarters. So what was the reason for this growth? Okay. So, you know, if you see slide 32, we have given a very detailed explanation of what our strategy of goal on the construction real estate book is. And how should you look at in terms of going forward? So one is that uh, construction and real estate finance, what we are doing earlier through NBFC, <coughs> which was against land and against SRA project, which is a higher risk. So suppose you have a piece of land which is say 100 crores and construction cost maybe 30, 40 crores. So normally what happens is bank lend only against the construction part of it. And that is what we will continue to do through our HFC. Now that is where your yield will be lower, superior and the risk is lower because you start construction after you receive all the approval. But historically many NBFCs, suppose 100 crore land is there, people would lend uh, 50 crore against the land also, which may be a takeout or maybe for some other purpose or maybe for part consideration for land itself. So that is something that we are discontinued. But uh, what we will continue to do are two things. One is uh, through our HFC, we will try and fund pro pro uh, pro only the construction part of it. And that also with two more conditions that we try and make sure that they are fulfilled. One is that we fund affordable uh, housing uh, projects and not uh, anything else. Secondly, we are lo looking primarily or predominantly at green and environmentally uh, uh, responsible or environmentally sustainable projects. And also what has been done actually is that we have signed up with uh, uh, 
ADB and we are in advanced stage of negotiation with uh, ADB and Propeco <laughs> for funding these. Uh, so they are quite keen to support construction of green projects and affordable also. And they will probably give a line of credit which can be used primarily for this. Okay. Other than this, the earlier funded projects, what we have done through NBFC, although we are not taking up any new projects of the similar type, but that's where if there's a last mile funding or a construction or something required, we'll continue. Within the sanction of board approved uh, limit, so those projects will continue to be funded. Okay. But transfer to AIF, uh, what portion has been transferred to the AIF? Uh, or is the project still going on? You are planning to transfer? Yeah. We, we are trans and when we transfer, we transfer at that point in time, whatever book we had about a third of it. But then we realized that the terms of AIF are not great and uh, you end up paying 18, 19% interest when you can borrow at 8%. And also most of the projects now are seeing uh, a recovery of demands in the next two to three years time. We should see that uh, most of them get, uh, you know, uh, the cash flow basically pay them back. So if you look at our CRE, book over years, then in FI 19, it was 5,055 crores. It's gone, it's become half now almost uh, at this point in time. But you know, in the HFC component, we'll continue to fund some of the CR, and this is what most of the HFCs will do. So if you see very highly established HFCs from HDFC to everybody, they will have some component of their book, uh, which is for uh, developer funding. That basically dovetails into home loan also, because most of the projects that you fund, you may have a priority access to the customers who are buying uh, housing units there. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, thank you. That was very helpful. Congratulations. You probably will give you a very uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, no explanation on what our strategy is. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star and then one on your touchtone phone. The next question is from Abraham Ayer of Deutsche, Bank, uh, Deutsche CIB Center. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, my first question is actually pertaining to you know the microfinance segment. Uh, we've clearly seen a lot of growth here uh, from a quarter on quarter perspective, or even from a YOY perspective compared to the total AUM. Um, correspondingly, we've also seen sort of like a big jump in in the GNPAs. Um, some you know levels which I've not seen. In even in first wave or towards the end of last year as well, uh, is this primarily just the you know increase due to the RBI new norms, or is there any other factor here? And what's the company's overall strategy here in microfinance? Uh, are we like sort of focused on growing the book here? Uh, because the growth rate has been much much more than you know sort of the other segments. So microfinance industry normal December actually a disbursement from. So most of the microfinance companies have not yet reported numbers, but I would uh, uh, I would think that uh, the growth has been there for most of the microfinance companies in last quarter. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, GNPA growth, almost about one percentage is the uh, impact of RBI circular. Uh, and uh, other than that also, you know, the restructured book has come down a lot of uh, some part of, I mean, I think restructured book has come down by 20, 25%. So, some part of loan has come out of that also. Uh, but, uh, but then coming to the next part of your question, outlook. Uh, if, uh, you know, microfinance industry has been impacted by one or another region for, you know, uh, in last few years, several times. But if you look at the business and the customer, then they basically borrow loan for income generating activity and as a group. So typically under normal circumstances, performance is very good. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll have normal circumstances going forward. Then we'll see a strong pullback in the uh, GNP as well as improvement in asset quality and collection efficiency. Got it, sir. Got it. And uh, just sort of a follow-up question to this: What's your uh, strategy in terms of you know targeted AUM growth over say the next 12 months? So I think targeted AUM growth should be around 25 percent or so. Over 10 months, okay, got it. You know, one thing, but what we must keep in mind is that, uh, uh, so we are talking about product, and 25 to 30%, depending on how our coal ending picks up momentum, because coal ending is another uh, where, you know, if the bank basically have uh, a willingness to take more aggressive uh, approach, we will be obviously supporting them. Got it, got it. 
and lastly, I've seen that, you know, that resource raising has obviously been very robust for the bank and, you know, the, the liquidity buffers which have been maintained. Uh, is the plan still to just tap the domestic market here and, you know, or, you know, uh, is that a sort of thought process to return to the USC markets as well? Or, no, domestic market for debt, you say? Yeah, for debt. So for debt, at this point in time, domestic market liquidity is good and uh, interest rates are also going down. So if you look at fully hedged costs, then it doesn't make any sense to, uh, okay, it doesn't make any commercial sense to tap the overseas market on a, or through a broader issue. But you know, on the bilateral transactions of ECB, and actually we are negotiating with ADB and uh, you know some other multilateral uh, if organizations, if you get a good rate, then obviously uh, the, you know, the ECB market is there. But it will be a transaction specific. So at this point in time, at least we, are, we don't envisage uh, uh, kind of a public issue or a larger issue of bonds. Got it, sir. Got it. Thanks a lot for your clarification. Thank you. The next question is from Thomas Drisner of ABRDN Asia. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Um, very similar to the previous one, I was just going to ask on, on your dollar bond outstanding. So is your plan to retire that bond or will you decide at the time in about a year's time whether you refinance it in the dollar market and what the conditions are, what the conditions are like at the time? Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, our dollar bond was $400 million at the time of issue, and we have bought back some whatever is allowed as per RBI guidelines. In fact, we were allowed to buy more and, uh, you know, reduce our cost of funding on, a, on an aggregate basis. But if you really look at it, maybe 350 kind of thing would be outstanding, and we got a more than billion or $1.2 billion of liquidity on our books. So uh, the way things stand today, I think uh, probably, you know, we'll... we'll will repay the bonds, uh, you know, on maturity and uh, uh, under these conditions, it's unlikely to uh, refinance them. But if the, you know, interest rates improve for ratings or for some other reason, we can look at it. But for the time, I mean, as, I mean, you can see our financial numbers also. We have more than adequate liquidity. In fact, more, we have more than three times the liquidity to buy back the bond uh, uh, even at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Very, very clear. And, and just one, one quick follow-up. If you, if you were to tap the dollar market again, would you re-engage with one of the, the rating agencies? Or do you we'll think re -engage any the rating agencies, yeah, if you were to, to do another... Yeah, I think, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, I think we'll engage them. And uh, if you have to tap the dollar bond market again, uh, uh, then we'll have a dialogue with rating agencies and, you know, let them... Uh, Reevaluate the whole thing and make an assessment. See, I think rating agencies uh, also have to catch up because if you look at our capital adequacy now, it's 25 percent, 30 percent for uh, subsidiary company. They improved significantly. Our liquidity has improved. Our asset profile has improved. So uh, we'll we'll engage the rating agencies regardless of whether we do bond issue or not. But I think immediately after these results now, because we are quite clear in last one month, uh, we'll engage with them and we'll make. Uh, representations to them on the rating uh, uh, because I think there's a strong case for us to uh, uh, make them look at the numbers which are significantly better than what uh, they were when they uh, did their assessment. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Deepa Podar of Sapphire Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, for the opportunity. So uh, I just have one query. In terms of your credit cost, uh, so, so so how many quarters away we are uh, from a normalized credit cost of 1% that you have been uh, talking earlier? So. Deepak, actually, yeah, it's becoming, it's becoming a little bit of difficult or embarrassing to answer this question because uh, something other has been happening in every quarter. And like RBI circular or, you know, these kind of microfinance situations, we did not expect. So, I don't, maybe hopefully it should happen very soon. But I'll keep fingers crossed and let's see, you know, every quarter that how do we uh, get there. Uh, because every time we say something, but something completely unexpected happens. So, uh, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed. But hopefully, uh, in this year, it should happen. So this year means FY... Uh, 2022. Uh, yeah, yeah, 2022, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and RBI report impact. Uh, we have taken some provision this quarter. So, 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 uh, so, so, it's likely to continue into fourth, fourth quarter and first quarter as well. A higher provision. No, which which provision? Sorry, provision. Uh, RBI impact is. Yeah. RBI so what has happened is uh, that it came in the middle of the quarter, but now I think most of the MBFCs will try and make sure that their collection system as well as contractual arrangement with the customers happen in a manner that. Uh, you don't get into that trap of uh, having higher and be higher provisioning, and then you know it goes into a vicious cycle because it also impacts the customer's uh, credit rating. But uh, so I think this impact will taper off in next couple of quarters, March and June. It won't happen overnight, but I think this two quarters should get uh, fully adjusted. Okay, okay, understood. Okay, yeah, that's it from my side. All the very best. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is for Prashant Shedar of SBI MF. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, very much. So, uh, uh, I'm just looking at uh, this, uh, the real estate part, and you mentioned that uh, some 1800, uh, around 600 crores is, is left in DCC over quarter on quarter. And you also see the NPAs in that segment rising. So do we assume that uh, despite DCCO, some of these projects could not uh, complete in time? Is that the implication? I don't know. Uh, I would agree with that. See, the problem with the current, uh, you know, this sudden RBI circular where even if there's a one day delay or a, this thing, then obviously it has to be uh, recognized as NPA. But this kind of a scenario, it doesn't actually increase the risk on the uh, of the asset, what it was, but the reporting is a little different from the reality. So what happens in Indian conditions that, you know, people, sometimes they get delayed or the payments get delayed by a few days and obviously you get, uh, you're forced to report NPA, but uh, it should not impact uh, uh, the recovery or the quality of asset. No, uh, 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 what I was trying to understand so was specific to real estate. If we look at the performance of the projects that have come out of DCPO, um, how do they look? Uh, would any of them okay. have uh, slipped into uh, uh, NDA or something? No, no, no. So, uh, okay. Uh, they, some of them have been uh, paying after that, and some of them have paid a little bit of... Uh, uh, so, most of them, I think, are on track. In one or two projects, we've got a developer transfer. So we got the project transfer to a new developer uh, who is financially stronger and has a track record, which is good. So there doesn't have any delinquent track record. So I think uh, uh, things are looking better there. Sure. Uh, the projects are coming out of decisions. They're not getting into trouble. They're getting out of it. Hmm. Hmm. Is there a watch list or something uh, that you're tracking? And uh, are you able to quantify that? Yeah, actually, we see there are about 20, 25 projects that basically account for almost the entire this thing. So we 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 reviewed every week, and now we got a we got a team. We announced our team. So kind of from project monitoring to the financial diligence, you know. So we we have increased our resources there. So we are tracking them very very closely. I mean, we understand that this is a large chunk of asset, and obviously uh, it requires close monitoring and uh, recovery effort. No, sure, sir. Just trying to get a center of focus. And uh, just one other question on the gold uh, loan side. Uh, this quarter and last quarter, uh, from the disbursement you've done, uh, what is the average uh, interest rate and, and tenor of the loan in, in gold? So, average interest rate is slight downward pressure on that, uh, but uh, the tenure has not changed. And uh, if you look at our portfolio yield, it's come down from 18% last, you know, maybe by March end to around 17.4% now. So there's a 60 basis point decline on the overall portfolio. The boarding yield, which is the incremental yield, might have fallen by about 1% or so. I don't have those numbers, but my guess is the portfolio yield has also would have come down by around 100 basis points. So, and that is... Uh, oh, sorry, the boarding, portfolio yield uh, has come down by... Uh, in this country, it has come down by 60 basis points, no? 60 basis points, which is an entire portfolio of 14,600 crores. Hmm. And that's mainly because of bank competition? Or? Yeah, it's a massive competition at this point in time. And uh, so what has happened is that uh, there are many new players that are funded 
and also the banks are getting into this in a very aggressive way uh, and sometimes they may not be pricing the risk properly but at least in the market uh, there are competitive pressure on the yield and uh, I, I you know if you ask me we are seeing these kind of bout of competitive pressure earlier also so they happen sometimes another thing what happens in gold loans is that typical product is that you start with a low interest rate and uh, those low starting interest rates have come down to a very low level now and when the customer actually if it's not paying in time or is taking tenure or some other extension or whatever then the interest rates go up you know over a period of time sure sure uh, uh, that is a my sector thank you so much thank you the next question is from shadra singh of labunam capital please go ahead Hello. Yes. Hi, sir. Thank you for answering my question. Uh, sir, continuing on the gold loan, so where do you look at these rates stabilizing? I mean, do you see it already bottomed up, or how do you, where do you expect these to stabilize? I think you know some of the players who had offered these uh, what we call teaser rate. If you have seen the advertisement, like you know, for forty nine basis points, six percent types. So some of them have already withdrawn. Uh, or you know, and they understood that there is no merit in this, and uh, you know maybe this quarter, next quarter, okay, you know over a period of time they may stabilize at a little lower level. Those there may be a permanent damage of 50, 60 basis points, but they should stabilize in this and next quarter. So, uh, do you expect the banks withdrawing? Uh, the banks only being temporarily here, uh, aggressive here? No, banks are not temporary, but the. The problem is that the more competition from MBFC is more. See the wherever banks can reach out or customers can afford the process and time that bank turnaround time that bank takes, they will go to bank. So suppose you go to State Bank of India, they can give you a gold loan at six and a half seven percent, which obviously, but you have to go there to the branch. Uh, sometimes some of the banks basically take your gold today and give you loan tomorrow day after they approve when your rupee comes. So the the way gold loan product is that many customers who take loan for a very shorter duration, and they are they want to have it quickly done and flexible terms. So those are the customers that come to MBFC. Then there are areas and you know places where banks should go reach out or even the banks have branches. They may. So uh, and the market is huge. You know there's a bit of a significant part of market still with money lenders and pawn brokers who charge exorbitant rate of interest. So banks will be there. I don't think banks will withdraw for any, uh, uh, you know, that they'll continue. But NBFC is that we're trying to have teaser rates. You know, that might uh, that activity might slow down. Okay, okay, thank you. And so uh, the next question is regarding the provisioning on these NPAs. So uh, on these increased gross NPAs due to the RBI norms, are we taking some excess provisions here, or are we sticking to the ICL norms? So ECM norm is broader, which actually can be higher than typical index uh, or the gap accounting, which will require for RBA. So we are taking higher provisioning, broad basis. It's not that we are trying to link it to RBA circular, but ECM is a more prudent way of estimating losses and doing this. But we try and make sure that we are conservative in our provisioning requirement. So ECM require. If you see the RBA requirement. If you look at my entire book, uh, then as per RBI norms with the revised guidelines, everything, our provision requirement would have been 493 crores, which is there on slide 17, 493.5, whereas actual provision that we have taken in our books is 1246.3, right? So almost two and a half times what is required by RBI. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, okay, thanks. And uh, so one last question: in the affordable housing finance, where we're going. So what are our yields and LTVs, and who are we competing against here effectively? Uh, I mean, customer profile. If you could uh, could give some more light on the customer exact customer profile we're catering to. Monu. Yeah. 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 Monu, yeah. Yeah. Hi. So I'll just mention that. So if you see that we are, uh, uh, if you see our overall uh, portfolio mix, about 60-65 percent of our customers are salaried people. So these would be blue collared uh, employees uh, who are uh, seeking home loans. And we have a very vast majority of our customers who are also eligible for the CLSS subsidy. Nearly 50,000 customers we have given the subsidy as well. So these would be first-time home buyers. Their annualized incomes uh, would be for surely uh, annualized income below six lakhs, 
and uh, they would be largely into the blue collar segment okay okay and so uh, what would be the yields on these notes which we offer yeah so these yields the incremental yields uh, which we are able to get today is about uh, 9 to 9.5% oh, oh, okay okay yeah and the ltv so sorry uh, and the ltv ltvs would uh, range the uh, classical because we are in the affordable segment so these ltvs would be somewhere in the range of uh, 75 to 78% uh, average ltvs for a portfolio level Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Bhuvanesh Garg of Investec Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. So, I have a couple of questions on the assignment assets and the income. So, firstly, if I heard it correctly, you did about uh, 3600 crore of assignment uh, in 9M S522. Uh, is that right? No, you are saying 3600 crore will be the assignment in nine M F five twenty two. No, no. In one quarter, I think we do with this kind of numbers. Yeah, one quarter. Okay, okay. And that is in the last quarter itself. Okay. And what would be the number for nine months, sir? The total. Okay. The assignment is gross assignment then because some of them also get uh, paid back. I'll give you the number just one second. Six thousand four hundred crores actually nine months. So if you say three thousand four hundred last quarter, then three thousand in the previous two quarters, right? Yeah. Quarter one. Okay. Quarter one was not much, you know. Quarter one is typically COVID. Yeah. A slack COVID affected quarter. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so uh, in that case, can you please provide a breakup of the assignment book, like the kind of thirteen thousand crore assignment uh, assets we have? What is the breakup of those assets? Segmental breakup. Assignment book segmental broker means you are saying the asset wise, product wise. Yes, yes, yes. So I can give you a broad a breakup. Uh, one second. No, no. How much will be our home loan assignment? One second. I'll give you the numbers. Yeah. Number. So, uh, so home loan uh, assignment is uh, nearly about of six thousand crores. Five thousand eight hundred crores is home loan. And gold loan is also about six thousand. The remaining will be microfinance and business loan. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, and sir, next, uh, uh, sir, if we look at so uh, your NIM on assigned assets, so it is about six point six percent for uh, nine months. So okay. if we take sixty four hundred crores of assignment uh, during nine months and six point six percent of NIM, so our uh, income uh, should have been around three fifteen three twenty crores. Uh, but we no, see eight hundred fifteen crore of uh, income. So, so you know, but there will be assigned book of the. Uh, no, you are saying what should it be? Six hundred crore, you are saying. Six. Uh, uh, no, no, no. So what happens is this is the incremental assignment, but we have assignment of earlier also, and some of the assignment get repaid also. So uh, it's a flow. I mean, it's not a static number. Okay. So there is a assignment of the last year also flows into this year. There is some income on that also. Okay, okay. So it's a recurring income. So once the yeah. assignment is done. Okay. And, and so just uh, one last thing. So so if you look at your total assignment income, so it forms a significant part of your PBT for nine months. So it is about uh, like seventy percent of your PBT. So in yeah. that case, how how do you view the stability of this income stream going going forward? This is see the assigned assets are like also our loan assets within the which we continue to earn, and uh, uh, so this is I think this is this has to sustain and grow as we keep growing our assigned book and the co-lending book. You know the that's the key strength of our balance sheet and the financials. You know because there is a flow of income where we are not blocking any risk. Uh, we are not taking any risk or we don't have any capital block and it will be a sustainable income till the assets fully mature okay fine sir that's it for my side thank you wish you all the best thank you thank you the next question is from vivek ramakrishnan of dsp mutual fund 
Please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I thought I'll ask about the business loan segment, uh, where after a, a long time we've seen <clears throat> sharp growth in disbursements. It's I think about 970 crores in the last quarter, and the collection efficiency also has been the best uh, we've seen in a long time. Um, so does that reflect uh, the fact that uh, you know you're you, you were talking about a positive macro view? Does it reflect that you know that the business loan segment is picking up uh, pretty well and you're confident to grow the business? And also, yeah. I wanted to ask in the context of this, uh, you know, your uh, loan book is about 5,886 crores, out of which, I mean, 345 crores is NPL and 256 crores of restructured loans. So do you expect that the 6.6% is probably peak uh, GNP level, and do you expect that uh, to come down, and the, is the restructured book performing well? Thank you. I, uh, thank you. I agree very much, uh, you know, I think what you have saying is bang on, the restructured, sorry, the uh, SME, MSME segment, we are seeing a very strong recovery with the economic recovery. And uh, the asset quality from here should improve significantly. And uh, we have seen, uh, uh, what you are saying is absolutely right, that the traction last quarter has been very positive. And hopefully uh, the numbers uh, will be reflected in the next few quarters uh, uh, in this particular uh, segment of business. Also, you know, our DIY model now is getting very established in terms of quality of credit, delinquency, and growth. So overall, uh, uh, business loans should do well going forward. Uh, uh, excellent. And uh, just one, uh, so the AUM I noticed was 7,000 crores and uh, the loan book was about 5,886 crores. So the balance would be uh, ones that have been assigned to the right? That's right. Absolutely right. Okay. And is the performance difference between the two significant in the sense that, uh, in, in the sense would the numbers be even, even better than that uh, going forward? Yeah, numbers will be better, and uh, see, as things improve, we'll be able to even assign more. See what happens in assignment, that you have a first of all three months or six months evening, after that only you can assign. And if there's a slight delinquency, then obviously no bank will take it. So banks will take only assets, which throughout the evening period have been performing well. So the assignment basically will improve as the quality of book improves. Uh, but both, the, you know, so the assignment is a small part of the total book in the business loan segment, but over a period of time, it can become as significant as home loan and gold loan also. And I presume the collection efficiency is a leading indicator that you know things are improving. Absolutely. Uh, congratulations and all the best uh, to IFL. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Vikash Agarwala of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jen, uh, for giving me the opportunity and thanks for uh, providing all the update. I missed the uh, uh, early part of the call, so maybe um, I'm not sure if this question has been answered. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is, uh, wanted to understand if there is any challenges you are facing uh, given the recent Omicron wave and uh, you know in the, in the current quarter. So that's one question. And the second question is, I wanted to understand a little more on the co-lending side. Uh, obviously, there is some announcement which which has come in terms of partnership. But w what sort of you know disbursement are you seeing under this model? What's the target in the in the you know next year or so? And how does then it impact your assignment strategy? I mean, why would a bank choose a co-lending over assignment which you quite proactively do? So if you can you know share some thoughts on that, that will be helpful. Uh, good. Uh, thanks. First question. Omicron. Omicron. Omicron, yeah. So Omicron, uh, uh, Vikas has been, uh, in fact, in the December and beginning of January, we were very worried, but uh, thankfully, uh, it has not impacted much. I think people have, uh, you know, the business momentum continues, and more or less, uh, uh, you know, people are recon people are reconciled to the fact that this is this is spreading rapidly, but is not fatal and not something very serious. So. Uh, Omicron is not a big threat, you know, at least in my understanding, and uh, uh, more or less it's behind, it should, be like, you know, it should completely, uh, you know, from here on, I think things should get better. Uh, that is not impacted much. Secondly, about co lending and assignment. Uh, that's a good question. And uh, so uh, I'll tell you the difference. In case of assignment, 
it's a transaction by transaction. So bank will come and say, okay, this quarter we want to take your assets, so they will value at 500,000 crores of assets and take. The advantage and disadvantage both, the advantage is banks will take it when they need liquidity. But the disadvantage is that banks also don't have a continuity of asset flow because they also plan their balances, so they should know how much retail assets they're going to get from this channel. And from our point of view also, the co-lending works better because one, there's no seedling, it happens at the origination. Two, it's a continuous process, so you don't have to really worry about the transaction consumating, but you know that, okay, there's a partnership model, you only have to keep 20% of on the book, which you can easily do uh, through your retail earnings, and you don't have to worry about liquidity, you don't have to worry about risk. Uh, and obviously the challenges are that every transaction uh, get credit appraised uh, by both the institutions, bank as well as MBFC. So your technology, your processes, your workflow, everything has to be very smooth. And uh, resources are required from both sides. But longer term co-lending is a good model because the risk assessment is happening at origination. And both the partners know that this is how liquidity and asset flow will happen. So banks also know that, okay, we can expect so much of assets from this a co-lending partner, they also plan their liquidity and balance sheet, and we also plan. Uh, and you know, as the partnership becomes uh, uh, deeper, it becomes easy for you know people, both both parties to work. But the challenges are that you have to set system. Every transaction has to be approved. In case of assignment, okay, they'll set up a team. They'll go through a bundle of assets, choose what they like, and take. Uh, so these are the, there's a difference. I don't know whether that answers your question, because it does it does to some extent and maybe if you if you can also elaborate on you know what, what sort of target you have in this whole lending model in terms of disbursement in coming quarter or even say next financial year 2023 i know these are uh, this may not be very you know hard target but any prelim thoughts on you know what sort of disbursement per month or which product are, uh, are are you guys targeting more on the lending model so uh you know, I think, uh, as you said, that because these are unprecedented and uh, we probably are doing co-lending at a scale, at scale for the first time, I think next year almost half of our disbursement, uh, uh, the total overall disbursement of the company can be through co-lending models. So that should be our internal target. Okay, okay. I understand. That's very helpful, Mr. Jan. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Ashwin Kumar, Subramanian of HSBC. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my question again was on the co-lending uh, model. Uh, I believe you uh, mentioned that uh, uh, you did about 850 odd crores of uh, disbursement in the uh, home loan segment uh, through co-lending. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, when, when you say 850 out of that only. Uh, you know, 20% will be on your balance sheet, right? I mean, uh, is that the way to understand yes. this number? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's how it is. Right. And so when you're ma mentioning uh, in your presentation that you've done 1,600 crore of disbursements, that also includes 800, not uh, ordinary. Yeah, that includes 800. All of the 600 go on to banks, so basically 1,000 million on your book. Right, right, right. right. Right, and uh, uh, the uh, other thing is that uh, uh, so this uh, uh, this person uh, uh, which you've uh, 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 done uh, that will show up in the uh, uh, assigned portion, or I mean, like when you're saying on balance sheet or balance sheet, uh, uh, you know, mix which you're uh, if which you've given in the presentation. The remaining. Twenty percent. Twenty percent comes from our balance sheet, so this is part of loan AEM, yeah, it will be part of assigned assets. Uh, it will be part of loan AEM, but it will not be on our book. So 80% will be part of assigned assets. Okay. Uh, and uh, one more general question on the co-lending model. So uh, will the customer segment here be uh, sort of similar uh, to the uh, uh, customer segment uh, uh, which you otherwise lend to, or, uh, I mean, uh, considering that uh, these are, uh, I mean, uh, so the way it works is uh, that customer, so we, we when we negotiate with banks, we say that these are the customer segments that we target. So broadly, they have to be in agreement, then only the whole thing will take off. But having said that, when we source a loan, 
we have an option supposing we like the credit but we say that it's not fitting into the code ending criteria given by the bank we can keep it in our books so not 100% of the loan that we source will be code end uh, but there are certain uh, so we have certain policies and the bank has certain policies so whatever fits into their policies we give it to them and the remaining if we are comfortable with credit we keep on our books okay now just one additional question here uh, so uh, uh, the the loans that are lent through uh, this model uh, would they uh, have sort of a, a higher like let's say turn around time as compared to uh, the loans not that are really. not collect no because see the way practically it is happening is that an rbi has also allowed that that we disburse and then uh, the so you know if the bank is doing the co lending they we work like we are like the agent and we get money uh, reimbursed by the bank and then the loan asset so customer signs a tri party agreement where the option is it does to allow 80% of loan to go to bank and then uh, banks it may take a day two or a few days or whatever and if they approve it then they take it from the beginning and uh, for one or two days the interest adjustment is done but otherwise uh, uh it does but as far as customer is concerned there's no uh, no delay okay but uh, the customer will have a different interest rate right like if it's cold and no no it might be at a lower no well, interest rate remains the same so supposing customer's interest rate is 10% okay. and uh, loan lending arrangement with bank is 8% for theoretical reason then we collect interest at 10% we give bank 8% share on 80% because we are bank's agent the remaining interest is with us So even on that 80 percent. So supposing I'm charging 10 percent to customer on 100 bucks, so which is 10 rupees, right? right. On 80, I'll pay 6.4 to the bank, and 3.6 I'll retain in my books. Uh, and in terms of account, what happens is that on 20, two will go as interest, and the remaining 1.6 would be part of assignment income or part of other fee income. Right, right. So in in a sense, it's very similar to assignment. And the operating cost is to our account. So obviously, uh, you know, the, that's how the economics works. So, so it's very similar to assignment transaction uh, in the way it works, except that you don't need to hold it on your books for a, a seasoning period and that, all that. That is correct. It's very similar to assignment transaction. Uh, but here, like every loan, uh, you know, gets uh, and in assignment is a bundle. And in assignment, what happens that the bundle is rated by agencies, rating agencies. Here is a loan by loan. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Ray Pohanda of BCP Securities. Please go ahead. My friend, give me five minutes. I'm on a call. Hi. 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 Hi there. Thanks for the invitation. Just quick one. I have a two housekeeping questions. Uh, one is actually. Uh, so that, because we are just starting to cover uh, uh, IFL finance, and uh, can I just have a quick one as to who the IR is, his or her name? And secondly, is uh, with this record, uh, this, uh, Maria, we can't uh, hear you properly. Can you please repeat that at the local time? Thanks. Higher name. 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 Anu uh, Burgess is our IR, and the mail ID is ir at iifl dot com. Simple to remember, ir at iifl dot com. Yeah, but who is the person? If you don't mind sharing me the Anup, name. Anup. His name is Anu Burgess. Rajit. Okay, A-A-U. thank you. Anu Burgess. Okay, good. We'll circulate the name. My second question. And to my second question on whether this uh, meeting will be recorded or later on, if I would like to uh, replay. Yeah, it's recorded actually. Okay. Is it accessed on the website? Yeah, transcript is there on the website. Will be put up on the website okay, good. In, a, in a couple of days. Okay, good. Thank you so much. That's all I, I have. You can you can you share so uh, uh, QA on the website and we'll send you the link also. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it would appear that we have no further questions, and I would now like to hand the call back to Mr. Nirmal Jain for some closing remarks.
thank you everybody for being on the call. If you have any more queries or clarifications, questions, please uh, get in touch with our uh, investor relations or CFS department. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Antic Stockbroking, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now.